yeah so the first question okay now you see here this is a upsc question for you okay what is the purpose of district mineral foundation in india okay so this is exactly that has been asked in your upsc okay now this one is something that we have to discuss today okay that is what is the purpose of offshore areas mineral trust in india okay this year offshore mining is very very important for you it's important from your current affairs point of view it is important from your international affairs point of view also okay so it's very very important we need to cover this topic okay so first tell me which statements do you think might be correct here okay what is the purpose of offshore areas mineral trust in india okay a trust has been set up due to some regulation and based on it what is the functionality of the same that is what you have to guess one three fine One three, one three, one two three. Okay, what about others? One and three, one two three. Okay, one and three. Okay. And three. Yeah. Okay. So yes, you are right. That is the first statement is correct. The third statement is correct. With regards to exploration and production of offshore minerals, which is the entity which is responsible? We have discussed this in MMDR also in the previous class. Offshore minerals that are there, yes, it is central government which is there okay so the amendment to mmdr act we have discussed in the previous class okay so why are we focusing on offshore mining okay so many important news are there from this point of view that is one is india is trying to ensure that it is opening up offshore mining for the private sector okay so by the end of this year they are trying to open up the private sector for the same. Another important topic is regarding deep sea mining, which we have, I think, already covered some part of it. Okay. So here also there is certain UN negotiations of the same. Okay. So that also we will cover. So this topic becomes very, very important. Okay. So when you talk about offshore mining, what is it? It is basically you're trying to retrieve certain minerals from a depth of 200 meters. Okay. Depth of 200 meters or Above. Okay. Now, what the government has said, it has brought out an amendment also regarding the same. It has said that if we are giving offshore mining to private players, they can be granted only through competitive bidding. Okay. So, the production leases to private players, when we talk about offshore mining, they have to be granted only through competitive bidding. Okay. Now, when we talk about certain atomic minerals, those have to be granted only to state controlled entities. Okay. So the government will continue to allocate offshore production leases of high grade atomic minerals like uranium, zircon, and non atomic minerals also. Certain critical minerals also they can give only or they can reserve it only for state controlled entities. Okay. Now, whatever royalty that you get from taking out these minerals, they will be taken up by the central government. Okay. So this is an important aspect that you have to address. First, if a private player is entering, they have to enter through the option route that is competitive bidding. The second is certain minerals have been allocated only for the state controlled entities. Okay. Uh, specifically atomic minerals. Fine. 
Now here, when we talk about offshore minerals, the Geological Survey of India has pointed out certain minerals that they will like to focus upon. Okay, when we talk about offshore minerals. Okay, so what are those? You just go through it. Okay, lime mud is there, sand is there, heavy mineral places are there, phosphorite is there, and polymetallic nodules is also there. Okay, so a static content, but you should focus on the same. Okay, so when we talk about polymetallic nodules, yes, there are manganese, iron, nickel, cobalt, and copper. Right. Now, coming to the important aspect of it, that is the amendment that has been brought forth. Okay, that is offshore areas mineral amendment bill, not a bill now, it has been passed by the parliament, so 2023. Okay, so here this amendment has been brought, uh, this uh, bill has been brought to make amendment to the original act that was passed in 2002, came into force in 2010. Okay, so when we talk about offshore areas, mineral uh, development and regulation act, it provided for three basic premises. The one is reconnaissance, one is exploration, one is production. So these three aspects we have discussed in the previous class also. Okay, one is you're trying to find out where the minerals are, okay, through aerial mapping and all. One is you're allowed certain part of drilling, exploration part, and one is proper commercial mining. Okay, now in this amendment, there is a new license that has been introduced that is composite license. Okay, so the act basically introduces a composite license for both exploration as well as production. Okay, it also gives a time limit also under composite license, the licensee will be required to complete exploration within three years, a time period has also been set. Okay, now under the same bill auction has been made mandatory for certain private players. Okay, so this we have already discussed, the bill mandates competitive bidding for a production lease and composite license to private entities. If they want to enter into offshore mining, they have to go through the auction route. Okay. Now, what is more important here is there are many numericals here in the amendment. Okay. So, these three you should definitely note. The examiner will, if it, he is asking you the question on the same, there is high chance they will interchange the same. Okay. So, here it says, the maximum area for exploration that can be given under a composite license is 30 by 30 minutes longitude. Okay, that is, it is 30 by 30. The maximum area for undertaking production, that is commercial mining, offshore mining you are doing, it will be at a lower rate, that is 15 by 15. Okay, but at this, under the same bill, it also clarifies that there could not be concentration of resources into one person. Okay, so the bill also mandates that a person cannot acquire more than 45 by 45 minutes in respect of any mineral or prescribed group of associated minerals also. Okay, that you combine other minerals also. The maximum that can be given to one person is 45 minutes latitude and 45 minutes longitude. Okay, so three major numericals that you have to focus upon. For exploration, it is 30 by 30. For production, commercial mining that you're doing, it is 15 by 15. And for a person, an individual person, he cannot acquire more than 45 minutes longitude by 45 minutes latitude. Okay, so the limit has been placed here. So numerical component is there. Please focus on the same. Okay, now what is the validity of concession that the central government will give? It is for a period of 50 years. Earlier it was 30 years. Now it has been increased to 50 years. Fine. Okay, now regarding the mining of atomic minerals. So this we have already discussed. When we talk about atomic minerals, it has to be reserved only for the government or government companies. Okay, but in certain other areas where certain mining and reserved areas are there, there private players can enter for mining, but they have to enter through a joint collaboration. 
Okay. So here for mining in reserved areas, the bill allows that the administrating authority can grant a composite license to government or government company, but it can also allow to a joint venture also. Okay. So here private players can enter, but here the government company should own 74% of the paid up share capital. Okay, so if a private player is entering or through a joint venture also, if it is entering, it will be entering only through a competitive route. And if it is trying to enter, it has to enter through. The ownership should be still in the hands of government. Okay? The government company should own 74% of the paid up shared capital. Okay, this is regarding certain minerals which have been reserved. Okay, for the rest of the minerals, they can directly, the private players can directly enter the same for mining through competitive route. Okay, so when we talk about atomic minerals, what are those minerals? Okay, so under the MMDR Act, there are certain minerals which have been specifically mentioned, that is rare earth minerals, okay, pitch blend and uranium ore. So this is also a uranium ore, okay, and there is certain rare earth elements also. Okay, so they all come under atomic minerals under the MMDR Act. Okay, so please go through this aspect. Okay, now coming to the important aspect that is this amendment provides for offshore areas mineral trust. Okay, so it is a non-lapsable fund and this fund will be maintained under the public account of India. Okay, so what is this fund being used for? For exploration, for research, for providing relief if there is any disaster and to provide benefit to any person who has been affected by the exploration. Okay, so just like District Mineral Foundation question was asked, you can expect the same from this topic also. Okay, so please go through this topic. Fine, so let us just revise very fast. This is an important topic. So what are the important points that you remember regarding offshore mining? When we talk about this amendment, there is a composite license. Okay, an introduction of a composite license. And yes, competitive bidding has to happen for private players to enter, definitely. Okay, mandatory auction is there, yes. Okay, yes, the area for exploration is 30 by 30. Okay, yes, you have to complete exploration within three years. Okay, and it can be extended for two years more later. Okay, yes, exploration it is 30 by 30. For production it is 15 by 15, for extraction exactly. And the maximum limit, for one person, it is 45 by 45. This you have to definitely remember. Okay. Yes. What else? Yes, 30 years. Okay. So the, uh, that is 50 years. It has been provided. That is the lease that you are giving. It is for a time period of 50 years now. Okay. Now, apart from this, we also have what? Offshore areas mineral test. Okay, what is the specific purpose you can see here? Yes. Okay. No, 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 no. Uh, Tumpi, for atomic minerals, it is only government. Okay. Please, uh, this has to be very clear. They go for mining of atomic minerals, it is only government. Okay. If there are other any other minerals which has been reserved, okay, any other mineral which has been reserved, to uske liye private players can enter. Okay, yes, let's say a certain basin has been reserved for uh, government companies. There also joint venture can happen, but still the government has to have 74% stake paid up share capital. Okay, so I hope this clarity is there. Fine. 
All right. So the remaining we have already seen regarding minerals that are there on land. Okay. So minerals that are there on land we have discussed. Minerals that are there on sea also we have now discussed. Okay. So it's an important topic. Definitely do prepare the same. Fine. Okay. Now the next we are con the next topic. Okay. So here there is something known as the mining code. It is often heard in news. And it is related to what? Okay. So what do you think? Any guesses? B, B and D. Okay. B. There is doubt between B and D. Okay. So let's see here. Okay. Now this topic is currently, it's a basically a current affairs news in progress. Okay. Currently, UN is trying to develop this mining code. Okay. But UN has opened up its, uh, it has started to give permission for deep sea mining now. Okay. Without having a specific mining code. Okay. So this is something which is being currently talked about between countries. Okay. What should be the code for mining? especially when we talk about deep sea, okay? So it is a whole set of comprehensive rules, regulations and procedures, which are issued by international seabed authority to regulate prospecting, exploration, exploitation of marine minerals in the international seabed area, okay? So this is something which is uh, developing uh, as and when the UN does develop the mining code, we have to cover that also. I'll be covering this topic again because it's a very important topic. Okay. But for the time being, just know that this is related to exploitation of marine minerals. Okay. Now, why this is being important? Because currently UN is focusing on giving permission for deep sea mining in Clarion Clipperton zone. Okay, and there are many NGOs and researchers who have opposed the same. Okay, so here when we talk about this, it is basically a area under the Pacific Ocean, which is administered by the International Seabed Authority. And why is UN trying to give permission for the same? Because it has high rich content of nickel, manganese and cobalt. Okay, it contains more nickel, manganese and cobalt than than any known area on land. Okay, so that is the reason UN is trying to give up the permission for the same. Okay, and it is being opposed by environmentalists. Okay, so why they are opposing it? Because there is endemic species there which can directly be, uh, there could be result of uh, deep sea mining could lead, can lead to species extinction. Okay, so here you should just remember this Clarion Clipperton zone. This is in where it is. It is in Pacific Ocean. Fine, it's there in your Hindu also. Fine. All right, so now we come to the next topic. So here we have covered deep sea mining. When our current affairs aspect is updated, I'll update you in the current affairs class. Okay, so the next topic for us is petroleum. Okay. So here, this is your UPSC question. Okay, Petroleum and Natural Gas Regulatory Board. Okay, So here, I have created another question for you. You tell me which statements do you think might be correct here. Okay, The question is regarding Indian Strategic Petroleum Reserves Limited. Okay, So three statements have been given. Which statements do you think might be correct here? Mm -hmm. 
Indian Strategic Petroleum Reserve Limited was created by the Government of India as a special purpose vehicle under Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. The primary task of ISTRL is to construction of strategic crude oil storage facility. The existing crude oil storages are constructed in underground rock caverns. Okay, two and three. One and two, all. Okay. One, three, all of them. Okay, what about others? Two, three. Okay. So let us see here what will be the answer, okay, from the coming slides, okay. Now, why am I covering this? So this is again an important current affairs news that you have to focus upon, okay. See, a government-owned engineering firm, it is actually Engineers India Limited, okay? So this is the uh, company which is responsible for setting up all of the petroleum reserves that are currently there in India, okay? So it is trying to study whether petroleum reserves can be developed in Rajasthan salt caverns. So this is from current affairs point of view, okay? Now, why is it relevant? Because... If the idea comes to fruition, India could get, us, get its first salt cavern based oil storage facility. Okay. So currently, whatever strategic petroleum reserves are there, they are all underground caverns. Okay. So they are basically dug up and they are being stored. Okay. So now here, what you are trying to do is trying to find out another form of storage. Okay, so the country's three existing strategic oil storage facilities, they are mentioned here. Okay, Mangalore is there, Padur is there, and Vishakapatnam is there. They are all made up of excavated rock caverns. Okay, so India is the third uh, world's third largest consumer of crude. So that is uh, to ensure that there is enough buffer stock available. We are developing the same strategic petroleum reserve. Okay. Now, what is important for you here is why the salt cavern based storage facility is important because the entire strategic petroleum reserve program of United States, it is based on this technology, salt cavern based storage facility. Okay. So first and the foremost thing, let us see the management aspect. Okay. So the construction of strategic crude oil storage facility, it is managed by Indian Strategic Petroleum Reserve Limited. Okay. And it is under Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas itself. So it was developed in 90, it was created in 2004. And it is Engineers India Limited, which was instrumental in setting up this strategic petroleum reserve. And it is the one which is trying to now develop or see the feasibility of salt cables. Okay. Now, what is important for you is the difference between the same. Okay. So here, when we talk about rock cavern based reserves, what you are doing is basically you are digging up the soil here. You are trying to put, you are trying to put the petroleum here. Okay. That is the basic premise of the same. Okay. But when you talk about salt cavern, what you are doing here is you are introducing water you are dissolving the salt that is here, okay? And you are then taking out the brine solution, okay? So after the brine solution has been taken out, the area that has been left forth, here what is happening? Oil is being introduced, okay? Oil is introduced here. Now, when you want to take back the oil, what you do is you reintroduce brine solution here, okay? Now this brine solution and oil, they will not mix. Okay, so when the brine solution will again be reintroduced, the level of brine solution will be will increase because of which what you will have, the oil will be pumped out. 
Okay, so this is the basic premise of the functionality of salt cavern based reserve. Okay, so here the underground rock caverns they are developed through excavation, whereas when you talk about salt caverns, they are developed by the process of solution mining. Okay, so you are pumping water into the geological formation and you are dissolving the salt deposits. Okay, so after the brine is pumped out, the space that is left will be used for crude oil. Okay, so this process is simpler. It is also faster and it is also cost intensive, less cost intensive. Okay, now there are other advantages also of developing this. One is uh, these are naturally well sealed. Okay, their absorbency is also very low. That is the brine solution and the oil, they will not mix. Okay. And uh, they can be operated entirely from the surface. Okay. And you can use the same technology for storing liquid fuels, natural gas, compressed air and hydrogen also. Okay. So there are certain advantages of using this technology. So that is the reason you should focus on the same. Okay. So operating of salt cabin. So this is basically the explanation of what I just gave. Okay. So go through the same. Fine. Okay. The next, achha, now this one is very, very important topic. That is you have global solar facility. Okay. So another, so we have covered right now two major current affairs uh, part that is offshore mining we have covered. Then next we have covered is basically petroleum, which was there in current affairs. Okay. So today's topic is minerals and energy sources. Okay. So here we have another global solar facility. Uh, answer of last, achha, what is the answer of last question? This one. Indian Strategic Petroleum Reserve is a special purpose vehicle under Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. That is correct. Okay, if you are eliminating the same, you should be able to think of another alternative ministry. Okay. Yeah, it is set up for strategic crude oil storage facility. That is correct. And all the existing crude oil storages that we have currently is underground rock caverns. Okay, we are trying to develop the first salt cavern. Okay. So all three are correct, right? Okay. Now we come to the next energy aspect that is solar. Okay. So with reference to International Solar Alliance Global Solar Facility. Okay. This is an important topic. Consider the following statements. So three statements have been given. You tell me which statements do you think might be correct here? Okay, so this is a solar facility that has been recently launched you know, at the COP27 summit. Okay, COP27 summit is there. This is an important topic that you should cover. Two, three. Okay, uh, let us see the content here directly, okay, because this is very important. So, okay. so see, when we talk about global solar facility, okay, why it is in news? Because yes, the International Solar Alliance, it has announced that it will be paying an extra contribution of $35 million, okay. So 25 will be given by International Solar Alliance, $10 million will be given by the government of India. Okay. So, Indra, yeah, so it is announced that global solar facility, uh, yeah, so certain investments will be made here. Okay. So, it is a payment guarantee fund found by ISA. Okay. So, this was launched at COP27. Now, what you should focus upon here is the aim for setting up this facility. What is the primary function? 
Okay, these are the two major aspects that you should focus upon. Okay, so here when we talk about this global solar facility, it is to catalyze solar investments in Africa. Currently, the aim of this investment is this fund is to promote solar investment in underserved segments and geographies across Africa. Okay, because investments uh, that is uh, climate friendly solar investments are not happening. Nearly about only 1 to 2 percent is happening in Africa. So that is the reason this fund has been created. Okay, now what this fund does is it basically gives the private players incentive okay, to enter into projects in Africa. Okay, so the aim is to attract private capital to set up solar especially when we deal with off-grid solar projects, okay? That is decentralized solar projects when we talk about it. That is the primary focus, okay? Off-grid solar projects, rooftop solar projects, and productive use solar projects. That is battery, electric battery recharging and all, okay? So you are trying to attract private capital, not for the grid solar projects, but for off-grid solar projects the decentralized aspect. So it helps the common man move. Okay. Now, what does this fund seem to achieve? Okay. Seek to achieve. It aims to mitigate project risk, provide technical assistance, reduce currency risk, and resolve the financial uncertainties in the energy, solar energy sector. Okay. So currently, this fund is focusing on Africa. Later, this will be expanded to Asia, Latin America, and Middle East also. Okay. So currently, the target for GSF is 100 million US dollars. Okay. So what you should focus upon here is, one is, it is a fund which has been created to provide solar investments in a very particular area that is currently Africa. Okay. Here, the focus is on attracting private capital, especially for decentralized solar projects. Okay. Off-grid solar projects, rooftop solar projects, and productive use solar projects. Okay. So, it is basically a kind of trying to mitigate project risk that will be done and that will be there when you take up projects in Africa. This is the primary aspect. Okay. Now, tell me which statements do you think might be correct here? Okay, so this is something that you should know. So is a payment guarantee fund established to facilitate solar projects across Africa? This statement would be what? It would be true. Okay. Exactly. It will be true. It aims to attract private capital specifically into grid connected solar projects this would be false okay yes the government of india along with achha, this one actually is correct okay i think i have not mentioned this content uh, this is actually correct okay bloomberg philanthropies and uh, some children trust fund is there okay so they have actually pledged financial support to gsf so here the answer is actually one and three Okay, so please go through this. This is important current affairs. Fine. Okay, so solar is done. The next one, energy, when we talk about it, nuclear. Okay, so here, this is your UPSC question. Okay, and there are many UPSC questions on nuclear. Uh, thorium is there. Okay, ITER question is there. Okay, IEA safeguards is there. So many questions on uh, nuclear has already been asked. Okay, so along the same premise, this question has been framed. Okay, which of the following statements is are uh, correct regarding pressurized heavy water reactors? Okay, so you tell me which statements do you think might be correct here? Okay, it uses heavy water as both moderator and as a coolant. It can use natural uranium as fuel without the need for enrichment and it is not capable of being refueled. 
violin operation no it is actually mirza it is plain but it has a very specific purpose that is the reason i gave that statement okay grid connect wala because the reason for setting up of the fund itself is very specific it's not developing solar projects in africa it is for off grid projects okay so that is the reason i gave that statement explicit function is there that is the reason you should know the explicit content there okay fine okay so tell me here which statements do you think might be correct one pressurized heavy water reactor one okay one and two one and three one and three one and two okay. Okay, so yes, there can be doubt between one and two and one and three. That is possible. Yes. Okay. So let us see here. Uh, let us try to answer this question through the content. Okay, in the next slides. Okay. Now, why are why am I covering this topic again? Important. Okay. So you have a, an indigenously developed nuclear power plant, which is now running at full capacity. Okay, that is Akrapar Atomic Power Project. Okay, now why this is important? Because it is the country's first 700 megawatt unit and the biggest indigenously developed variant of pressurized heavy water reactor. Okay, so earlier, some years back, it, it uh, reached the criticality point. Now it is running at full capacity. Okay, so the largest indigenously developed nuclear power plant in unit starts operations at full capacity. So this is important. Okay, so earlier, did we not have pressure pressurized heavy water reactors? We had, okay, but they were of lower megawatt. Okay, so earlier we started with uh, 100, 150. Okay, the last one was 540. So this one is 700. Okay, so when we talk about the term criticality, we basically mean what? We mean a controlled and sustained nuclear fission reaction. Okay, so this was achieved some two or three years back. Okay, but now when we talk about the nucleus, uh, nuclear power, why is the government also focusing on the same? Okay, so the government is highlighting the uh, and highlighting the uses of nuclear power at a very, it is promoting also at a very large scale that you can observe in the G20 declaration also. Okay, the reason is solar and wind are not reliable for long term. You know, it is not always reliable. So here the next best thing is nuclear okay and currently the nuclear power capacity that you have in india is nearly about two percent okay so that is the reason we are going with pressurized heavy water reactor now what is the basic advantage of using this reactor okay so the very basic advantage is it uses natural uranium as a fuel okay so you do not actually need to do enrichment here that is the major reason for taking up the same. Okay. So uses natural uranium as fuel and heavy water as moderator. Okay. Now there is significance of this 700 megawatt reactor also. That is, it marks an improvement in economies of scale and it addresses the excess thermal margins also. Okay. 
Now, what is the main reason for selecting PHWR, that is pressurized heavy water reactor in 1960s for the Indian nuclear power program? It is because you can use the natural uranium oxide as it is available in fuel without processing. Okay. So right now, when we talk about our nuclear power capacity, it is a mix of pressurized heavy water reactor and pressurized water reactor. Okay, so the Kundam Kulam plant that is there, that is pressurized water reactor. Okay, so why are we going for both of them together? Because there is a special advantage. Okay, the spent fuel that is used here in the pressurized water reactor can be used can be reprocessed and the same fuel can be used as fuel in pressurized heavy water reactor. Okay, the spent fuel of the former, which will contain more than 1% of uranium-235 can be reprocessed and it can be further utilized. Okay, so that is the reason in our current nuclear program, we are focusing on both the nuclear reactors. Okay, now based on this, which statements do you think might be correct here? Pressurized heavy water reactor. They use heavy water as both moderate and cool, moderator and coolant. That is correct. Okay, and this is also correct. Okay, is not capable of being refueled while in operation. That is exactly wrong. That is the actual advantage of. PHWR, that you can refuel the same. Okay, you do not need to stop the entire nuclear power plant to refuel, which is not possible in traditional nuclear reactors. Okay. Now, see here, the next important reactor that you should focus upon is the small modular reactor. Okay, now why this is for why we are focusing on this? This type of reactor has been mentioned in your G20 declaration. Okay, so when in the G20 meeting also, the Indian government was pushing up two energy aspects. One was in space. Okay, that is privatization of space. And here specifically SSLV, small satellite launch vehicle. Okay, whereas in nuclear the Indian government was pushing for small modular reactor. Okay. So here, what are the advantages of the same? Okay. Why is it that uh, the Indian government is trying to push for this, especially in developing countries? Okay. So one is it is a easier transition towards renewable energy. The second aspect is it is also quicker to build because they can be pre-made and assembled on site. Okay, so when we talk about small modular reactors, their electricity generation is relatively very less. That is near about one third of traditional nuclear reactors. Okay, but they can be used in a decentralized scale. Okay, so they can be used in areas with limited power infrastructure, even in remote locations okay so generally when you talk about nuclear reactors they are made up based on the place okay, if it is lying in coastal area another form of nuclear reactor if it is inland another form of nuclear reactor but here they are built pre-made and you just assemble it on site okay so the power plant based on small modular reactors also require less refueling and they can also run without refueling for decades. Okay, so they save the cost also, construction time is also lost, is also saved. Okay, so there are certain advantages of the same. They have been specifically mentioned. That is the reason I'm covering this topic. Fine. Okay. Now coming to the static content, just the uranium mines have been mentioned here. Please go through them. Okay. So this is nothing that uh, we can contribute here. You have to go through this 
uranium mines directly a question can be asked okay bima basin uh, certain sigmum thrust belt is there okay or certain mines if you go through the previous year question certain mines have been asked and they are located in which state has been asked similarly they are famous for which mineral has been asked okay so mines uh, especially you should focus on these okay? so here certain basins are there they are known for uranium fine please cover the same so here the most important one is the one in sigmum thrust belt okay so it is the first uranium deposit to be discovered in india okay so world's largest reserve of uranium it is in australia so static content please go through this fine now now we come to the next aspect the next mineral that is coal okay so this is your upsc question already asked so based on the same question has been created okay consider the following statements two statements have been given you tell me which statements you think might be correct okay state monopolies government companies and public sector units cannot indulge in anti competitive practices in violation of competitive competition act 2002 and there is a second statement coal india limited is subject to competition law which statement do you think might be correct one only two only both or neither both okay two Two. Two. Okay. ठीक है so two is fine. Now what about this one? See here, state monopolies, government companies, and public sector units. If you are saying this is wrong, that means can, I cannot. Because again, can over, right? Just the opposite. So it is saying state monopolies, com government companies, and public sector units can indulge in anti-competitive prices practices. Is that possible after liberalisation? ठीक है, basically both the statement mean the same thing, okay? Both are, नहीं state monopoly can also not go for anti-competitive practices, it cannot, it cannot say कि okay, nobody है ना वो एक practice नहीं कर सकता, competition when you are talking about liberalisation that means आपने competition ला दिया, that is the very basic difference between the Previous act. You know, when you talk about MRTP Act, it was you are trying to preserve the government entities that are there, the government monopolies that are there. When you are talking about Competition Act, it is ensuring fair competition. That is the basic premise. Okay, so here actually both statements are correct. Okay, now why we are focusing on this content? See, it is based on an observation made by the uh, recent judgment made by the Supreme Court. Okay, so the Supreme Court has said that Coal India Limited would come under the purview of Competition Act 2002, despite being a public sector undertaking. 
Okay. And at the same time, the Supreme Court has also mentioned that state monopolies that are there, government companies that are there, and public sector units that are there, they cannot be allowed to indulge in anti-competitive practices in violation of the Competition Act 2002. Okay. So let me just explain this with an example. Let's say uh, IRCTC is there. Okay. One case was there regarding IRCTC giving it wanted certain rails. Okay. It's a monopoly. Okay. It is directly, it entered into an agreement for purchase of rails through sale. Okay. Sale is making the rails. Okay. Both are, this one is a monopoly. This one is making steel okay now what happened here is basically a private player that is jindal steel what it did is it directly went to competition uh, commission and it claimed ki IRCTZ being a monopoly it is misusing its power that is if it wants to purchase rail it should seek what competitive bidding it should not directly enter into an agreement with another entity, government-owned entity. Are you getting this, Nishant? Okay. So this is an anti-competitive practice. That is, you're not reaching the market for seeking out the actual price. Okay. And it is here that Jindal Steel actually won. Okay. All right. So this is clear. Now, so that is the reason both statements are correct. Okay. Now, coming to the next aspect, next current affairs of Coal India Limited. Okay, So, when we talk about Coal India Limited, it is basically the largest coal producer in the world, right? So, it is earlier, it was focusing on open cast mines. Okay, But now, the Coal India Limited is planning to scale up the production for underground mines. Okay, So, here, what why they are focusing on underground mines because of the nature of environmental laws that are there okay so there are other advantages also see so currently 96 percentage of the coal output that the coal india limited gets it is from open cast mine okay but the coal that will be derived from the underground coal mines they are superior in quality okay and they also reduce import burden for higher grades of coal okay they are also minimally invasive on land it uh, there is no land acquisition that is need needed and it is also environmentally clean okay so you are getting uh, superior quality of coal you are not uh, you are going with the environmental laws also and you are practicing environmental clean practices okay so this is the reason why they are now focusing more on underground coal mine okay so earlier you can see this is what is known as open cast mine okay so if you have to uh, get a mineral you have to acquire the land and then whatever practice you are doing you are trying to destabilize the environment it's not an environment friendly practice okay whereas when you talk about an underground mine what you are doing is you are directly creating a tunnel okay and from here you are trying to take up minerals okay you're trying to get mineral my uh, minerals from the underground area okay so here the top layer it's still not affected okay so that is the basic premise of underground mine okay so you can also reach out to exactly where you want to get the mineral okay so i hope this is clear now Coming to the static content, okay. So the current affairs aspect we have discussed, Supreme Court verdict we have discussed, and underground mines. Okay. The next one is the static content of coal. So here, yes, when you talk about coal, it is found in the Gondwana. Okay, so this is exactly your UPSC question. In which rocks do you find the same? Okay. Now there are important coal fields that you should know. The Jaria coal, coal field that is there, it is the oldest and the richest coal field with the best bituminous coal. 
okay why bituminous coal is needed because for steel production okay so india is the fourth largest coal reserve and second largest producer of coal in the world okay now despite having all these coal reserves we are not able to meet the quantity of coal because there is a clear cut monopoly and of cil okay so here last year there were certain coal shortages also so uh, depending upon whether there could be many reasons why we have coal shortage in the okay okay so now coal deposits in india yeah focus on the important valleys that are there okay godavari mahanadi son varda okay now there are gondwana in gondwana rocks you find coal deposits and then there are also tertiary coals especially in the northeastern side okay here focus on these coal fields okay they have been asked in your upsc okay namfuk coal fields that are in arunachal pradesh makum coal field delhi jaipur coal field that is in assam okay so important coal fields please go through them okay so the largest producer of coal what is the state the largest reserve of coal what is the state okay now apart from this in one of the competitive exams i have also found out a question that which of the following coal mine is not located in jharkhand okay so that is the reason i have covered this aspect at least important coal mines located in jharkhand you should definitely know because it is the largest it has the largest reserve of coal okay so please go through these mines okay now where are these mines located so here you have the diagram okay you should draw it in a map properly then only you will remember the same okay now apart from this the other aspect that you should note here is the types of coal also okay so there are four basic types anthracite bituminous lignite and peat okay now why are we focusing on this let me tell you through the upsc question okay so both of these are upsc questions both of them are upsc questions already asked okay so see here which one of the following types of coal contains a higher percentage of carbon than the rest okay similarly which of the following states are this namfuk coal field located okay so coal field and its respective state is also important okay so that is the reason we are covering this so when we talk about the important types of coal yes anthracite is the best quality of coal has the highest percentage carbon content 80 to 95% carbon content okay it has the highest calorific value also okay but for steel production we focus on bituminous coal that is carries 60 to 80% of the carbon content and it is used for smelting iron in blast furnaces okay so found in certain states please go through them fine similarly lignite is also there peat is also there so basically the percentage of carbon content reduces okay earlier it is 80 to 95% for anthracite for bituminous it is 60 to 80 and for lignite it is 40 to 55 and peat it is the lowest form of coal okay so you have to cover this also okay where it is found especially focus more on anthracite and bituminous fine right? okay now regarding principal emissions that are resulting from coal combustion okay so here you can see again this is your upsc question okay so see the statement that is given that is coal fired power plants they release sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen into the environment okay high ash content is observed in indian coal so characteristics of indian coal have been there is another upsc question that has been asked regarding characteristics of indian coal okay so that kind of content is important okay so principal emissions when we talk about them resulting from coal combustion it is sulfur dioxide nitrogen oxide particulates carbon dioxide mercury fly ash and bottom ash please go through them A static content but it is 
important right so here in the coal topic we have seen the current affairs point of view we have seen the important coal fields are not gone into detail uh, because this is a static content you need to prepare it yourself okay specifically focus on the coal fields that are located in jharkhand okay then we have focused on types of coal and if you are basically burning up coal what are the principal emitters okay these are the areas that we have discussed okay now okay now we come to the next content okay so the next one is science related current affairs okay so this is your upsc question asked regarding the difference between sodium lamp and led lamp Okay. So here you have another question that is which of the following are potential applications of quantum dots? Okay, so it's a science-based question, but it was an important current affairs. That is the reason I covered it. You tell me which statements do you think might be correct here? Potential applications of quantum dots. Okay. Very good. So when we talk about applications, generally, yeah, you go with all. Check. If it's not that, you know, it's not that different, you go with all. Fine. So here, why are we focusing on quantum dots? Okay, so this is again a very important topic. So here, the 2023 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, it was awarded to three persons. Yes, but why it was awarded? It was awarded for the discovery and synthesis of quantum dots. Okay, so this is important from the application point of view also important. Okay, so when we talk about quantum dots, it is basically a combination of certain atoms. Okay, it's a combination, it's an assembly of certain atoms which are exhibiting unique optical properties. As and when the size of the quantum dot changes, the optical nature of it also changes. The light that it reflects also changes. Okay, so that is the basic premise of quantum dot. Okay, so they are tiny particles. Okay, they are not basically atomic in nature. Atomic means you're talking about in the atom scale okay they are not also bulk in nature okay bulk means you have proper aligned atoms are there okay here what you are talking about is certain few thousands of atoms combined together and they exhibit unique optical properties due to their small physical size okay now what is the unique point here is the properties of quantum dots can change by changing their size. Okay, depending upon their size, their properties also changes. Okay, so that is a one, that is a unique point that you should note. Okay, so they are also called as artificial atoms. Okay, now what is the application which is more important? So the simplest application of quantum do dots is to light up your computer monitors and television screens. Okay, it is also used in photovoltaic cells. It can be also used in medical purposes, medical surgery to highlight a tumor. It can has in chemical reactions. It can be used in telecommunications. Okay, it is also now used in nanotechnology. It is one of the major components that is used in nanotechnology. Okay. It can be used to map biological tissues. It can be used to treat certain cancer related ailments. Okay, for targeted drug delivery, for nanomedicine. Okay, it can also be used as a security marker on currency and documents as an anti counterfeit measure. Okay, so for the future, future application could be flexible electronics, minuscule sensors for quantum encrypted quantum communication for all of them yes application of quantum dots could be there okay so please go through this already these kind of questions have been asked both in your prelims and in your mains in mains it was 
blue LEDs. Okay, so in prelims also it is it has been asked. So this aspect you have to definitely count. Right. Okay, come to the next topic. Next mineral. Okay. So here, this is your UPSC question asked in your 2023. That is night rutile ore of which of the following. Okay. Similarly, created another question that is siderite and limonite. They are found in parts of central and northern India. They are sources of which one of the following? Which one do you think? Any idea? Take care. Yeah. Don't go with D just because that is the only option that has been changed here. Okay. Itna bhi ye nahi karo. Examiner go. Take care. You see aluminum, copper, iron is there. Here also aluminum, copper, iron is there. So only one is changing. That might be the answer. It's not like that. Huh? Not always. Okay. Yeah. So here it is actually. Sand. Fine. Now, why this is important? Because coal is done. The next one is iron ore. Okay. So here when we talk about iron ore, Yes, again, what are the areas that you should focus upon? Okay, one, one you will focus upon is the state which has creates the maximum production of iron ore. Okay, so here you can clearly see it is Odisha. Okay, so this has been updated from the Ministry of Mines website now. Okay, so when we talk about iron ore, more than half of the iron ore production that is there, it is from Odisha. Okay, so Orissa is the largest producer of iron ore in India. Okay, so if such a statement is given, Orissa accounts for over half of India's iron ore production. That is a correct statement. Okay, now here, yeah, India is the fourth biggest producer of iron ore in the world. Similarly, as we discussed about coal, anthracite, bituminous, okay. So here, when we talk about iron ore, we focus upon two basic iron ores, that is hematite and magnetite. Okay. So here also what you should focus upon is the state which has the largest reserve. Okay. Here it is Odisha for hematite. For magnetite, it is Karnataka. Focus on this aspect that is more than sufficient. Okay. So when we talk about iron ores, four types are there. Magnetite, hematite is there. And then you have siderite and limonite also. Okay. So richest hematite deposits, they are found in this valley. So again, this valley known for which mineral? It is iron ore. Okay. Now apart from this, there are certain keywords. Uh, that is the reason I have included them. Largest producer, largest mechanized mine. Okay. So, Baladila mine that is in Chhattisgarh, it is the largest mechanized mine in Asia. Okay. So, here also the same aspect you will focus upon. The region is given and the mine is given. Okay. So, just go through them. I know that mineral topic you cannot learn in one day. Okay. So, please understand this. We understand that the content is, the static content is very much here in mineral. Okay. But these kind of questions are asked. That is the reason we are giving you the same. If you can remember even one point, if you can solve one question because of the same, so that becomes important. Okay. And last year, two questions came from the mineral PPT. Okay. So that is the reason this year also focus on both the PPTs in detail. If two questions you can solve correctly, it will give you an advantage. Definitely. Okay, so yes, so here region has been given, 
important mind has been given again static content go through the same okay so add no deposit mines they have been mentioned here take your time uh, see if you can remember them fine okay now we come to the next current affairs point of view so here you can see gi tag okay so here gucci question already a upsc question okay so along the same lines another question has been framed with reference to yak chopi okay mentioned in news consider the following statement okay recently a gi tag was given to this product okay so it's a cheese product widely consumed in jammu kashmir as a delicacy expected to provide benefits to tribal herders against cold and hypoxia which statements do you think might be correct here any idea One three, one three, all. Hmm. Okay. Here, whenever these kind of questions are there, where would the examiner focus upon? Okay. For example, see here, with reference to Gucci, here, here the examiner could have played played with the statement. Definitely, he could have. Okay. But he focused to play on this aspect. Right. What is the reason? Commercially cultivated. Okay. Similarly, here, which such keyword do you find here out of this three? Something which is commercially cultivated. So it may not be. Similarly, yes, widely consumed. Exactly. Okay. May not be. Okay, so please understand this aspect, the mindset of the examiner. Okay, state definitely be allagos of that. Okay, so let us see the current affairs point of view. So, yes, it is a GI tag. Okay, so this is three indigenous products from Arunachal Pradesh. They have been granted the GI tag. Okay, so here you have Angsa Textile. Kamti Rise and Yak Churpi. Okay. So Kamti Rise again Arunachal Pradesh. Tangsa textile. It is a textile product which is created by a particular tribe and known for its exotic designs and colors. Okay. So please go through this. Now, what is more important here? I thought from my perspective would be this one. Okay. Yak Churpi. So it is basically a cheese product which is prepared from the milk of Arunachali Yak. Okay. So you are trying to milk this animal. Okay. So I am feeling sorry for the person who does the same. But he is, it's a unique Yak breed found in the Kaming and the Tawang district of Arunachal Pradesh. Okay. It's a naturally fermented milk product. Okay. And it is reared by a certain tribal people. That is the reason. Okay. So the this product, it acts as an excellent source of protein. Okay. And is considered as a substitute for vegetables among tribals. Because they live in the hills. Definitely they do not have access to enough vegetation there. Okay. So this acts, this provides them with the Necessary protein content. Okay. The product is also expected to provide benefits to tribal herder, herders against cold and hypoxia. Okay. So it's a cheese product, widely it is consumed, but 
from our point of view, it is in Arunachal Pradesh. Okay. And reared by tribal pastoralists. Okay. So please go through them. Now, based on it, which statement would be wrong here? Fine. I hope this is clear. Okay. All right. So next question. Okay. So here we have covered coal. We have covered iron ore. Okay. The next important one that you have to cover is steel. The three most important topics that you need to cover. Okay. So we are covering steel. So here an assertion reason question has been framed for you. You tell me based on current affairs. Okay. You tell me which statements do you think might be correct. Assertion is right. Reason is also right. It supports the same. It does not support. Assertion is right. Reason is wrong. Assertion is wrong. Reason is right. Okay. A, B, C, D. Which do you think might be correct? Assertion is Bilai has become the first city in India to get a processed steel slag road. The reason is the initiative is important as the utilization of processed steel slag paves the way for sustainable use of waste and reduces the reliance on perishable natural aggregates. Which, which one will you go with? Assertion is right. Reason is also right. And assertion supports the Reason supports the assertion. That is A. Okay. Assertion is also right. Reason is also right. But it does not support the same. Okay. That is B. C is assertion is wrong. Reason is right. Assertion is right. Reason is wrong. C. Okay. What about others? P, you mean assertion is wrong. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so for these kind of questions, you have to exactly know the content, right? So why we are covering this? First city in India. Okay. So from current affairs point of view, it is important. Okay. So let us see the current affairs. It is actually not Bilai. It is Surat. Okay. So Surat has become the first city in India to get a processed steel slag. That is, you are creating a road out of this. Okay. Now, what is the uh, reason for the same? Okay. Uh, yeah, it is basically a joint venture project. So there are certain advantages of this road. Okay. First is definitely industrial waste is there, which you are using for constructing a road. Okay. So your construction cost is significantly lowered. Okay. So construction cost of the process steel slag, it is 30% cheaper than by roads built from natural aggregate. Okay. But because it is a steel slag, durability is also higher okay than natural roads okay so your carbon foot is also lower now there is only one negative which is associated with this process the negative is the surface the upper surface of the road that has been created it will be one to two degrees higher in afternoon when compared to the regular ones Okay, so here the construction cost is cheaper, durability is also higher, carbon footprint is also lower. Okay, but the temperature wise, okay, the upper surface has a greater degree, one to two degrees higher it is there. Okay, but does it affect the automobiles, the tires of automobiles? The project manager says it will not. Okay, so the project falls under the initiative of waste to wealth. 
and clean india campaign okay so when we talk about circular economy especially when we talk about in the steel production aspect this news is important okay now let us see here in steel uh, which topic should you cover okay so in steel you should focus more on green steel production now okay so till date all the questions that have been asked regarding steel production this is regarding the basic uh, the basic materials that you require for the production of steel okay or certain issues that have been uh, that are there okay the supply constraint issues that are there regarding steel okay but now we should focus more on the transition towards green steel this is the area that you should focus upon okay so here steel is there india is the world second largest producer of crude steel yeah so the first company that was responsible you know oldest steel plant of india it is tesco okay steel is a deregulated sector all the decisions that are taken they should be taken by the respective companies it is not the government's interferences not there here okay now when you talk about the steel plants that are there in india please go through them okay important steel plants you should note okay static content now apart from this the basic materials that are required for steel production this also please go through them okay so when we talk about the steel production the current steel production here we have basically the mix of iron ore lime and coal okay so you take iron oxide calcium oxide and coke you mix it in blast furnace and basically the carbon from here takes up the uh, it separates the oxygen and you have the carbon dioxide formation okay and this is what is not environment friendly and this is the process that we need to change okay so currently the iron oxide that is there is heated with coke okay so iron oxide that is there it is heated with coke and a blast furnace okay and it is remelted and oxygen is uh, blown okay so that is the basic process now depending upon how much percentage of carbon you require you are trying to uh, redo the process again and again that's the basic aspect okay now when you talk about the steel production the major constraint you have is regarding cooking coal right so what is the major constraint here with regards to cooking coal so cooking coal is mainly used for manufacturing of steel through the blast furnace route okay but all the domestic cooking coal that we have it has high ash coal content okay so you cannot directly use them in the blast furnace that is the major constraint okay so here the domestic cooking coal it has to be washed and then it has to be blended with imported cooking coal before utilization okay so here jharkhand is the primary producer of cooking coal now why do you need the supply to be increased because there is huge demand for the same our steel production is also going to increase so there is huge demand supply gap okay so import dependency is also higher so there are certain constraints regarding one of the major components of steel production okay and it is here that we have the new environment friendly steel production green steel production okay so when we talk about green steel production what happens instead of coke you are trying to replace the same through hydrogen okay so this is the current process and you are trying to replace it with hydrogen okay so here it is hydrogen which will be responsible for taking out the oxygen and the iron that is there which will be used for steel production okay so when we talk about green steel production you are using hydrogen as the reducing agent or you are trying to remove the oxygen in steel production okay so the use of hydrogen is potentially more environment friendly than using carbon 
okay now why this is important gills green steel production this is very very important okay so when we talk about the green steel production there are certain disadvantages okay so we have seen here that is hydrogen in green steel production the only thing you have to do is introduce hydrogen okay but we cannot do so because of certain technical reasons directly into the blast furnace okay into the in into blast furnace you cannot directly put hydrogen okay so there are certain limitations because of the same okay so there is new uh, news current affairs news that is you have the tata steel which is trying to successfully inject a small quantity of hydrogen into one of its blast furnaces okay it is trying to do so even though techno technically you cannot entirely substitute coke with hydrogen in blast furnace okay for that you directly need electric furnace okay now what is the significance of this news it is for the first time in the world that such a large quantity of hydrogen gas has been continuously injected into a blast furnace okay now what is the significance of this it has the potential to reduce coking coal by 10 percentage resulting in 7 to 10 percent reduction in carbon dioxide emissions okay so here when we talk about green steel production up to certain quantity okay up to certain quantity we can try to replace coke with hydrogen but not all okay so why is it considered challenging so putting hydrogen into blast furnaces is fraught with difficulties okay because the hydrogen that is there it needs external energy to have a have a reaction okay whereas in the initial process what happened is if you just provide cer certain amount of heat the coke will start to burn up okay and it will react with the iron oxide here whereas for hydrogen it is endothermic reaction because of which the reactions that are happening inside the blast furnace they are different and there can be issues of structural stability also okay there can be ruptures in the blast furnace also okay so that is the reason this is very significant they are trying to do so for the first time in the world okay now what are the challenges now this is important we want to transition towards green steel okay but there are major challenges so this kind of question can be directly asked in upsc okay so the first aspect is when you try to introduce hydrogen instead of coke the reaction that is there it becomes very slow okay the initial reaction that was there the time of that reaction becomes very slow okay so the reaction needed to make steel using hydrogen is sluggish the second major challenge is the indian iron ore that is there it is unsuitable for making green steel okay so earlier what was the problem earlier was coking coal okay so earlier we did not have we had high ash content in coking coal that was a major problem now if we substitute it with hydrogen what is happening the problem lies with the iron oxide itself here okay so that is an important point that is the iron ore the indian iron ore is low grade okay it is low grade and the low grade iron ore can only be used in steel in blast furnaces okay for green steel for making green steel you require electric arc furnace route and the electric arc furnace route it requires high grade ores of iron ore which is not there in the uh, indian iron currently okay so indian iron ore that is there it is low grade and for green steel making you require the electric arc furnace route okay now similarly the third major challenge is if you use hydrogen in the process green steel production it leads to embrittlement of iron also which leads to cracks and fractures in the metal okay so there are three major challenges 
which are there when we talk about green steel production. This slide is very, very, very important. Okay, so please go through this. Okay, so let us just revise very fast what we learned about green steel. I want to ensure that it is very clear. First, what was the major challenge with respect to steel? Normal steel, which ingredient was the problem? It is cooking coal. Okay, what was the problem with cooking coal? It is high ash content, exactly. Okay, because of which you need to wash it up and you need to mix it with imported cooking coal that comes from Australia. Okay, a major point of contention you might have heard regarding the Adani issue right now, raised by. Okay, so that is the major point. Fine. Now we have green steel. And green steel, what is the problem that we are facing? You are trying to replace coke with hydrogen. But still there is certain problems. It slows down the reaction. Very good. The reaction is very slow. Okay, the process of making steel is very slow. What is the second point? Major challenge. Indian, nay, Australian coal is cheaper. The coal, the issue was not that. It was uh, when it comes to India, the cost of it rises. Okay, but that's not our point of view. Our point is ki, why we are importing cooking coal. Okay, that is also a UPSC question. Okay, not the logic of this, not needed. Yeah, the second one is. The iron grade, yes, exactly. Okay, that iron ore that we have, it is low grade. If you need to provide, uh, if you need to produce green steel, you have to produce it through the electric harness, electric arc furnace. Okay, but currently all the steel produce, pr being produced, it is being done through the blast furnace in India. Most of the, okay. Most of the steel produced is done through the blast furnace route. Okay. What is the third point? Second, we have seen that iron ore is of low grade. And third is cracks, exactly. Okay, brittle, embrittlement of iron because of which there is cracks. So three major challenges. Why it has been stated that green steel production in India may not actually take place. Okay, even though the government wants to go for the same. Okay, so that's a very, very important topic. Please do cover the same. Fine. All right. Okay, so with that, I end the class for today. Okay, now apart from this, in the minerals topic, there are two more minerals. One is manganese. Okay, that has been asked. Sand minerals are there, which has been asked, and something regarding diamonds, which have been asked. Okay, so these slides I will directly give to you. Okay, I'll put it in the PPT and I'll directly share it with you. Okay, there is no current affairs component here, that is the reason I have not covered this. Okay, so static content is there, I'll put it in the slide and I'll share it with you. Okay. Focus, when we focus on minerals, focus more on critical minerals, coal, iron ore, steel. This is the major chunk of question that has been asked till date. Okay. And offshore mining also. Fine. All right. So if there is any doubt, now that person can stay back. The rest of you can leave the class for today's over.